welcome to the Culture Books Podcast. We're on episode four, Temple of Light. My name's Sheridan and I'm joined by... Hello, I'm John and uh, we just want to note that the sub-chapter at the end of this is a bit of a trap for new players. It's called what? State of Play? State of Play. This is an exceptionally long chapter. (laughs) It's a very long chapter, but we're just noting that if you haven't read State of Play, we are going to cover that in this. And the reason is that the table of contents does not list it as a separate chapter. Neither does Audible have it as a separate chapter. No, and it doesn't have a chapter number. But, like, when I got to it, I literally had to spend some time dicking around and checking the contents to see, because it gets a new page. It does look like it's a new chapter. Indeed, we're late with the podcast because I didn't know it wasn't a new chapter. Despite and me talking to you about it. <laughs> had to read it. <laughs> And I did like when you finally read it, you sort of came out with a frazzled look on your face and said, that was a really important bit of the chat. (laughs) Um, So having got that out of the way, um, folks, uh, let's, what are we going to do now, Sheridan? Well, you're going to recap us, aren't you, on where we're at? Yes, in 30 seconds. So there's a war in space, there's a mind of a civilization called the culture, it's um, been lost as part of the war, it has fallen onto a planet of the dead called Shah's world, there's a changer called Horza who's on the other side, the Adirans, and he has had some adventures and has been rescued floating in space by a band of mercenaries and has proven to the mercenaries that he is worthy, uh, but he's still got a mission to capture this mind on behalf of the Adirans. Boom, done. I think they're actually pop. Oh. Just in time. I think you're cheating because you're watching the timer, yeah, whereas watch I'm the timer. not watching the timer. But they're <laughs> actually pirates. See, Olsen in this chapter says we are not mercenaries. We are pirates. Well, that's in this chapter. I was recapping. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now. Hang on a second. Um, are you ready to give us the 30 second speed run through the chapter? All right. Hang on. I've got to get, I've got to get my two note pages up. Go. Sure. Oh, do I go? Horza is with the pirates and they're going to the Temple of Light to raid it to make some money, but things go really wrong because the Temple of Light is made of crystal and they shoot each other and they end up shooting themselves. And I can't really say anything more on that. Oh, he bangs Yolson. Woohoo! Um, but then we go to the next chapter, not chapter, and we find out a lot about the culture. And they're basically run by machines so that they can sit around and talk Latin to each other. Yes. Okay. Well, I guess we're done. That's that's the podcast complete. Um, or maybe not. Okay. So there is the first part of Temple of Light, which is uh, Hawes' conversations with Craiglin. Can I just actually say... Mm-hmm. If it's not obvious to anyone, I don't rehearse my summary. <laughs> <laughs> no, none, neither of us do. Okay, good, because um, I think it's probably obvious from the delivery, but I, I really don't rehearse that. Um, sorry, you go, go again. Uh, I was just going to say, so the, the very start of this is conversations on clear air turbulence, descriptions of clear air turbulence. Um, there was a really nice line early in the chapter describing clear air tom- uh, turbulence as a venerable Hronish armoured assault ship from one of the declining later dynasties and was built more for ruggedness and reliability than for performance and sophistication, which it's, um, you know, it was an idea and this book was everyone agrees heavily referencing Star Wars and the idea of the, um, the ancient, pa- ancient future was something that Star Wars was quite revolutionary with and this idea that this ship has come from the later dynasties of some civilization we don't know, but obviously they were declining in their sophistication so they were just building rugged simple ships which it's like the equi- the space equivalent of a combi van very much so nice one yes uh and for dramatic purposes it is very much sort of filling that area um and uh and then we get a lot of description of um the the, the, the crew the crew yeah what did you make of them all well they're a ragtag bunch aren't they they don't you know, there's some natural alliances there. There's some, there's a lesbian couple that, you know, no one talks to. I saw some weird, do you think there's some weird homophobia in this? I think the idea that lesbianism was unusual was probably a bigger thing 
in mm. the night or, or somewhat taboo. Probably, yeah. I mean, you know, in, it's maybe just a at some point of its in the time. future, um, you know, step siblings going at it will will be completely normal, and we'll look back on the taboo of. Um, Let's the, not go too far. <laughs> I'm just talking the way that um, pornography prefigures. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's an interesting line about Yalson here, um, where Horsa found it difficult to think of her as a woman at all. I oh, know. I um, thought that was a bit harsh, given the sexual tension and the. Yeah. Conclusion of the chapter where mm. they do have sex. Yes. Which is actually described in very sort of sort of twee sort of terms. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so so they, they say, In the darkness of the cabin on a small bed full of strange scents and new textures, they performed the same old act. Theirs, they both knew. I can continue, but basically they don't actually say that they had sex, but everyone knows that's what they Yeah, did. the same old act is, is a reference to sex. That's after the raid on the on the temple. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. you're jumping ahead of me. Sorry. I, yeah. um, I, d- I, I really I liked that there was a real sense of poetry to that description of um, seeking comfort in each other and, um, you know, in the, the, the bed of their dead comrades um, and just a sense of the time and space in the galaxy that even though they possibly do come from the same genetic stock they don't think it's possible to have um to interbreed they're so distant Mm. um you know that 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 lost in the vastness of the galaxy really uh came through to me um in in that one um we do start the chapter though with horza finally becoming a bit younger yes he's getting getting fitter and his venom teeth are returning he's got a very specific number of days until they're back that he does Mm. yeah well, like given the, the scale of the opponents he's facing, I'm not sure poisonous little teeth are going to be very helpful to him. I don't think they would have been very helpful to him in the <laughs> fight that ensues in the chapter, which we'll go into. No, which is sort of part of the scale. Um, but let's go back to um, Craiklin and the conversation with Craiklin. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of the, the description of task shifting in Craiklin's brain? So the description here that he's got an enhanced hemispherical task division one third of the time, one half sleeps and he's a bit dreamy and vague. The other t- third of the time, the other half sleeps and he's all logic and numbers, but he doesn't communicate too well. The other third of the time, like when he's in action or when there's an emergency, both sides are awake and functioning, which makes it pretty hard to sneak up on him in his bunk. Well, I mean, the dreamy and vague's just like me at work between the hours of 3 and 4.30 p.m. Yeah, I mean, you do nap for <laughs> you sleep for another about 14 hours of the day, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, and then Hawes is saying, wow, we've got paranoid clones and a man with a shift system in his skull. Um, I did like the description of Craiklin's plan for the, uh, the Temple of Light, that it's, uh, full of priests and treasure. We shoot the former and we grab the latter. Um... I mean, it's clear from all the description of the whole entire crew that there's a vast array of genetic quirks that it within these subspecies. They're all humanoid. Most of them are humanoid. Yep. Um, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, Crakeland has a massive advantage with his ability to be, and that's why he's the leader, I assume. Yeah. Now, there's a line in here when Yalson's dialoguing with Horza where they talk about... Um, Vavatch Orbital, which we've we're sort of been heading towards for a while. And uh, the line is, um, with these big effing GSVs they're building, these days they don't need bases on O's or rings or planets or anything else. Did that make any sense to you? No. Do you want me to explain it a bit? Sure. <laughs> okay. I must admit, I don't think I would have... I didn't, didn't remember it, but there's a, there's a lot in this chapter that there's, doesn't make a lot of sense or is hard to sort of fathom and get your head around. There's a lot, so I'll try and unpack them. So... GSVs are general systems vehicles, which are huge ships, miles long, with possibly billions of people on board. Um, O's are orbitals, which is um, huge structures um, that um, are sort of like a bracelet in space, and they're spun, and so they hold um, gravity, and they hold um, atmosphere in them. And then rings are sort of super large orbitals that um, you put around a whole star, so at the orbit of, of the Earth, so that um, you, you get the, a, a huge chunk of the energy of the, um, the star. 
which is an idea that Larry Niven invented sort of based on a subsection of Freeman Dyson's spheres. And these are structures that people look for today, trying to find civilizations in space, um, rings and spheres around stars. Um, but the, 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 the kind of interesting this idea that the culture is getting past planets uh, because they don't like the idea of messing with the ecosystem and covering it with people. They want to let the planets return to nature and they can put the people on these enormous structures that they can build in space. Um, so that's kind of where it's heading there. And then they've got this description of um, the fact that the the culture wants to ev evacuate um, the Vavatra orbital before the Adurans can capture it. And um, for, for Horza, who's just starting to grasp the scale of the conflict, he's... he's chosen sides in it, it seems crazy that the billions and billions of people on an orbital could even be evacuated mm. that you could have um something you know an, enough shipping capacity to, to move them it um you know he literally says still only a lunatic would think of trying to move everybody off an orbital mm. um yeah um so then we get to Craiklin's discussion um with Horza, which i've been <laughs> trying to navigate us to for a while what did you think of this conversation well, I mean, he's definitely suspect on Horsa and what his abilities are, but he doesn't seem – it doesn't seem to me as though he and he thinks he's a changer and it's almost as though um, Craiklin's just a bit too arrogant and thinks, well – Craiklin's the hero of his story. He yeah. doesn't think anyone can, else can be the hero of their story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff with d dis discussions of drugs. Um well, and he's just a bit of a, he's a bit of a meathead, isn't he? You know, he's quite excited by the culture's sort of sexiness. I do like the idea that the culture are coy about their, the way their genitals work and things like that, mm. um, which, uh, of course, if you're coy about it and don't like to talk about it, that's when people really yeah. get interested. <laughs> so I think the culture might have thought that one out very clearly. And the, you know, Hawes' little internal dialogue of all the, um, People who've had um, imperfect um, low tech modifications to try and make themselves like the culture, but they don't upgrade their um, their hearts mm. and their, the rest of their bodies to deal with the, the stresses of this um, tantric ordeals um, was, was kind of fun. And they start to talk about how people in the culture have got glands and just give themselves drugs when they want it, mm. which is. Um, Meanwhile, uh, Craiklin and Horza are sucking on um, fumes from bowls, which sounds a bit like brandy balloons, but also sounds a bit like um, passing a bong around. Yeah, well, it's sort of almost like the equivalent of well, crack cocaine versus regular cocaine, because sometimes you can sniff it and get really high. You can just have a little sif sip oh, and... There you go. <laughs> oh, that's actually not a great analogy, because they listen to different sort of deliveries but anyway yeah. um but we, we definitely we're dealing with a future where um drug use is extremely widespread and not particularly stigmatized yeah but there seemed to be a little bit of a stigma that well it's all right to drink it but you know if you huff it <laughs> you might be going a little too far yeah um and there's just a little because i think luck is a bit of a hidden theme here there is a little line where they're talking about uh the fight against Alan and then crack and like mind you you were lucky um, I was. I found in the chapter the discussion about the different types of books have a bit of a. Um, well, they're based both in, I guess, maybe class might not be the right word, but position in society and education. What well, the number of moving pictures in the books indicates the lower class you are. Yeah. So, um, sorry, his name's escaping me, but the guy that Horsa killed, Zalan. Zalan. Zalan reads these micro pages. Which are or have moving pictures, and they seem like comic books. And mm -hmm. Cracklin's got real books, which seem yeah. you know. And then the medics got these. Um, oh, I can't remember what they call them, but they're, they're a book that's for about the medical procedures that seem more like a scientific kind of book. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we're talking about someone who's making a living as an author. A screen um, book, I think they call it. Yeah, but someone who's making a living as an author, particularly in the nineteen eighties. Obviously, he hasn't quite figured that we'd be sort of abandoning printed books. Even. Well, it just seemed to, it sort of seemed um, quite relevant, given that we're reading this book on real book, Kindle, and Audible. Yeah, <laughs> so we're definitely format multi wars. We're, <laughs> we're multimodal on it, and I, I've always felt that what makes a book is not the medium it is on; it is the expression of the ideas. And audiobooks kind of a, a really weird um, modern 
forward expression of that, whereas I'd still like to think of books as being about words and, and reading being how you absorb those words off the page. But obviously, you know, audiobooks are a totally valid way to um, yeah, consume them. Yeah, and I've got to say, I, to be honest with you, I'm really only doing the audiobook to refresh my own memory of what I've read. So. Sure. So you are still reading it, yeah. Um, and then Craigman sort of reveals that he was probably going to get rid of Zalan anyway, which meant the whole fight to the death was entirely... Oh, no, yeah, he's a douchebag. Yeah, well, I mean, he's definitely being set up to be a douchebag. I think part of that is to make us feel a bit better about what Hawes is planning to do to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have a spoiler there that I don't. Uh, it's in the chapter. Um... Yeah, when he says, my n- and for my next trick, impersonating Craigland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which also I like because he's like, oh, everyone's so mean to changes. They think we're just going to mimic them and kill them. And, and he's, he's like, like, I'm going to mimic them and yeah. kill them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then we get to the big description of the... Um, the fight. The fight. Well, no, not to the fight. We get the description of the crew. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I've got to say, I don't know if I was that invested in it because I actually, I've got it, and this might be me just misinterpreting what's going to happen, but I don't feel like a lot of these characters are going to hang around, so. Okay. I might be wrong there. I felt they were more to present the nature of the universe that we're, we're in because we're still pretty early in the book, right? Yeah. Um, so I didn't really, I don't know, I just didn't feel like there was going to be a lot of investment. I mean, look, half of them die in the <laughs> fight. I a lot of them die, yeah. Um, so I was correct on that. <laughs> uh, so then we get the description of they're on the, the shuttle of clear air turbulence. They're coming into the um, where the Temple of Light is and... There's a bit of description of how Craiglin said he didn't want to bother with things like, um, you know, scouting. Which seems <laughs> ill-advised <laughs> almost immediately. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of action, a lot of action um, in, in the Temple of Light. And I do like the idea that because of the lack of scouting, they just figured, oh, the, you know, the, the, the Craiglin had plans and he'd heard obviously done some intelligence gathering on this facility, but they just had, oh, the, the monks don't have any laser weapons. And they thought that was because they were really primitive and undefended. And what it turned out was because their whole temple was built of crystal that reflected laser. And mm. so laser weapons were incredibly dangerous to use in the facility. Um, but the, the Craiglin's company only discovered this, um, the extremely hard way with most, I mean, the, the chaotic description of the, the main hall with all the, the monks shooting and the, company shooting themselves and the, the poor Brad Silkins who turn out who have just been a short comic effect. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, I, th- I feel like Cracklin's going to get in a lot of trouble from his crew though, because when they come upon it, when the cat, mm-hmm. they do get fired upon and there's a discussion of, I didn't think they had any weapons mm. and people are like, well, I think we should have bought yeah. And he just ignores them. I feel yeah. like that's going to come back to bite him. Yeah, I, I did. I, there was actually a sense, though, that the company was more competent in combat than I, I'd been expecting. Yeah, they've definitely done it before. Yeah, and, and individuals knew what they were doing with things that they were doing. The, and the, they seemed to understand the weaknesses of their, you know, technology um, yeah. and, you know, what people are better at and mm. not so good at. Yeah, that yeah, um, so that, that was, uh, you know, and things like the, the drunks had all sobered up for the fight. And, um, yeah, and, and then this, this, you know, towards the end of this bit, the description of the war was partly caused by the greater galactic conflict taking, like, taking place around it, as well as being a tiny and approximate image of it. In that reflection, it was that reflection, Horsa realised, which had killed the members of the company as much as any bounced laser flash. And this is something that's very true in that really big conflicts, you know, World War Two. we just think of, um, you know, the big armies moving around Europe, but it spawned splinter conflicts everywhere. Mm. Um, chaos like that does unfurl fractally. And then all sorts of factions pretend they're on one side or another just to have a side to, to join. Um, and we're just going to take a little minute right now to refresh our drinks, and then we will get on to State of Play 1. 
So, uh, we are drinking, well, I'm drinking, we bought a bottle of whiskey, which is Six Isles uh, mixed, blended um, Scotch whiskey as our first review whiskey, because Ian M. Banks was a famous uh, whiskey writer and uh, drinker. And I've mixed it with soda water tonight because it's quite warm. And my God, it really turns into a smoke bomb um, with soda water. So that's something to, to consider. Now, Sheridan, State of Play 1... I, this is the first time we really see the culture on yeah, its own or, turf. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you find out a little bit about Balveda, obviously, but she's... For she's, such she's special circumstances, so she's a edge case. Right. Yeah, mm. and you don't, because of the situation she's in, in the narrative, mm. she's very aloof and you don't really find out about her as a person. Yep. Um, yeah. So tell me, what what were your impressions of the culture? Well, I just think they're total to- tosses, to be honest. Why do you say that? Well, they're just entitled. Um, they just sit around. They, they they basically invented machines to do all their work, so they can sit around learning Latin. <laughs> You're really offended by their enjoyment of life, aren't you? Uh- Yes. So this this uh, chapter is mostly a conversation between Fal, uh, who's a humanoid woman, and Jace, who's uh, this is the first time we've met a drone. The, I um, mean, the drone is much nicer than her. You think he's nice? He's in love with her, and she treats him like rubbish. But he secretly records her, and he lies to her. But she, she kind of knows that they're doing that. And he left her in pain for a day and a half. Well, you don't know that. She just suspects it. We, we're pretty sure she, they did, though. Yes. So... <laughs> and then they lied to her about it. Yes. Yeah. Um... But, they, but they seem to be mutually awful to each other. Okay. And also the setting is on the, um, the surface, the inside surface of an orbital. With the, the, these mountains rearing around. It seems very cold and antiseptic. You know, she's sort of alone in this pristine setting. Mm. Um, and so we meet Jace the drone and he's a big sort of a uh, um, bulbous. That, you know, drones are about as smart as humans. Um, and he's a very old one. He must be... I a... think they seem... The, the machines seem to be smarter than humans. Um... Well, obviously, minds are enormously smarter than humans. Seems uh, to be the randomness of the the humans that makes them a bit more. I guess maybe the right word is intelligent, mm-hmm. because through the sort of irrationality of human thinking, they come up with ideas that are possibly interesting. Although you've got to have seventeen trillion humans around to get thirty that are interesting. Uh, <laughs> True. <laughs> God, I wonder what those other ones are like. They must be very tiresome. Yeah, uh, and you know, there's this description that Jace was old, made long before aura fields were thought of, and had refused to be refitted to accommodate them. And then there's a mention that it was for, for a thousand years or more culture drones that had aura fields. So Jace is an extremely old creature. Mm. Um, and we know that minds are getting smarter and smarter all the time, so he must be predating a lot of the sophistication of of the modern minds. Um, and um, I do like the description of just real life. Yeah, because th- these guys have got this Olympian view of the conflict. I mean, Fowler's the, the referrer, you know, is literally one of the very rare, you know, there's the description if you keep tossing 17 trillion coins, a few of them are going to keep coming up heads every time for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, which also comes to ideas of luck. So you've got these re- referrers of which Fowl is one. And so it's, this is, this is almost the culture's high command discussing things. And they've, the, the minds have sent Jace to talk to Fowl about what's been happening with this, uh, you know, the war in the Southern Gulf. And I, I like the idea that she's like, well, why is this stupid mind still alive? If its capture would be so bad, why didn't it just let itself die? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I think they're worried because the mind has done something mm. that they didn't, think was, didn't think was possible. Well, the Durans didn't think it was possible. And they're no very worried about how... I think, too, that they're very worried that it was more than luck, that the mind has worked out how to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's that, but just also this idea that the smartest thing the mind could have done for the broader civilization is just suicide itself. By surviving and making itself possibly captured, uh, it, it's it's a real pain in everyone's ass. Mm. Um, they're so arrogant, though. They still think they're going to win. Well, not just that. They're saying even if this mind gets captured, it means that the war... We'll just go on for a bit longer, but we'll, well still win. Well, yeah, but they do also... Th- th- there's a sense of the heaviness, which is part of what the Temple of Light chapter was showing, was the carnage going on throughout the galaxy, the lives being lost every single day. And if this war goes on for another three to seven months, or the beautiful phrase, you know, it's a handful of months, and it depends on whose yeah. hand, <laughs> what, 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 what species hand we're counting. But th- that is billions of lives will be lost by the extension of the war. Yeah, but my sense is that that's not what the culture cares about. They don't care about the lives lost. Don't think so? Well, I've got a sense that they just see it as an inconvenience to themselves and they're sitting around. But, but to the extent we know what the war's about, it's because the Adirans were conquering civilizations and killing people and that was what the culture couldn't accept anymore. That's why they're fighting this war. So they, they are immensely cognizant of loss of life and trying to prevent it. They've just made a judgment that engaging in this conflict is going to result in fewer lives being lost. Uh, I'm not sure, though, that they're worried about the loss of life in itself. Well, I don't know this, and mm-hmm. unless I've missed something in the previous chapters, mm-hmm. that maybe they're worried about the effect of that loss of life has on their own existence, so like that it's a loss of like a resource or... Something that, that can advantage them. That's interesting. Well, we'll see how you think about that going forward. Mm. I mean, and the other thing too that I'm very interested to find out is the culture of society seems, well, actually I don't know, but I'm starting to feel like it's not very egalitarian and there's this huge hierarchy mm. in which even within, like, well, Balveda is seen as a like a lower level being. Yeah, which is an asset of special circumstances, yeah. Yeah, well, that's... I mean, what sort of society is that? Well, <laughs> that's, like, that's all of them. <laughs> I know, but, you know, we try and pretend that we yeah. try and get towards a more egalitarian system, and so that's an ideal. There's a description here um, that the minds are so intelligent that no human was capable of understanding just how smart they were, and the machines themselves were incapable of describing it to such a limited form of life. The culture had placed its bets long before the Aduran War had been envisaged on the machine rather than the human brain. And then this line you mentioned before, it left the humans in the culture free to take care of the things that really mattered in life, such as sports, games, romance, studying dead languages, barbarian societies, and impossible problems, and climbing high mountains without the aid of a safety harness. Um, So, I mean, the humans... I mean, they sound like a... You know, everyone's met that upper class student that goes to uni and studies philosophy and is an insufferable moron. Yeah, because daddy's going to get them a fantastic job when yes. they uh, graduate, no matter uh, what they study. Yeah. They sound awful. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, maybe, maybe if that was all everyone did, I'd be in there too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think this is meant, to, it's meant to be glib. And it's, it is. I think there is meant to be a touch, of, a hint of shallowness in here. That you know, the um, things that really mattered in life aren't really that important at all. Uh, which is probably why he leads with sports as the first um, thing mm. there. Um, yeah. Well, then you know, the other following line: a hostile reading of such a situation might lead to the idea that the discovery by the minds that some humans were actually capable of matching and occasionally beating their record for accurately assessing a given set of facts would lead to machine indignation, but this was not the case. Um, but then, so you've got Fal, who's essentially living in um, the Truman Show, um, with all the minds just watching what this weird human who keeps predicting things um, correctly is going to come up with. Um, I mean, the machines are going to take over, right? That's what's going to happen. Oh, they've already taken over. Yeah, but there's some sort of symbiotic relationship going on there where they kind of need one another. Do the, uh, do the machines need the humans? Well, they keep, um, you know, entertaining them and giving it... Well, least... they keep being entertained by the humans, I think, is the the closer well, way. Well, they're stringing them along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but they've literally 
moved the humans off the planets to, to let nature have the planets back mm. um, and, and penned the humans up in these artificial rings um, spinning around in, um, in space. I just don't, I just, there's something about them, the culture, humanoids, that, I mean, what is a life without suffering? It's, Ooh, now you're talking like an Adiran. It just doesn't, I, I don't see how it can be that rewarding. Possibly, yep. Um, there's a little line here where Fal thought it must be very strange to live on a planet and have to look over a curve. Um, this is the most trivial inconvenience possible. <laughs> well, it is to you because you've always lived on a planet and not been able to see things. Because God, I can them. tell you I've never gone out and gone, oh, God, I wish I didn't have that curve there. <laughs> Just worried um, about house deposits and 10-hour <laughs> yeah. um, work days. There, there, there's a little line here where they're discussing what the, um, the rogue mind did where... Um, they say, you know, um, Fowl says, I, I was told we couldn't even do that. And, um, and he says, the General War Council itself decided we should try to duplicate the feat using a similar mind and a spare planet. <laughs> <laughs> very, very big civilization to have spare planets <laughs> and disposable ones because they're, they're thinking if it, anything goes wrong with this process, it would, um, you know, blow up the planet. Uh, and then we get to Jace's, you think it's sweet, which I thought was interesting. So the description that Jace, which deep down was a hopeless romantic. The interesting Jace is ungendered there. Well, maybe I took Jace. Actually, yeah, I, is Jace gendered? Sorry, that might just have been me and my heteronormative. Well, it, the, just the line here is Jace, which deep down. Um, actually, you know what? I think throughout the chapter, the, Jace is not given a gender, so I apologise. Mm. Um, that was my own um, heteronormative bias playing out. Um, and gender binary. Um, it, there's a lot of it's, um, there's a lot of use of his, their name. I think. Uh, yeah. if I see it, um, as, as we go, I'll mention it, but it, it's now thinking the language is quite deliberate here. Anyway, Jace, which deep down was a hopeless romantic, thought her laughter sounded like the tinkling of mountain streams and always recorded her laughs for itself. There you go, itself. Uh, even when they were snorts or guffaws, um, Jace uh, could not die of shame, but also knew that it would do just that if she ever guessed any of this. Um, See, I mean, that's... It's kind of creepy, though, just recording her careless moments. But only for itself. It's not doing it for... uh... (laughs) What, it'd be worse if it was sharing it with its other artificial intelligences? I would think that would, you know, make it a little more... (laughs) A little bit more... Um, various or something. <laughs> okay, so Jace is desperately in love with her. Um, He's bring. Oh, it's bringing her pillows. Sorry, but, I, but I then, don't. Wouldn't you? Yeah, but I, then we can call a machine it. Can't yeah, we, but yeah. then lying to her about about getting them, which also is a little giveaway that there's none of this. They must always tell the truth going on here. Mm. He can just tell casual little lies. The pillows turn up to. Uh, for her to sit on, she's like, oh, where did these come from? Do you ask them? So I'm not. Um, yeah, I think that's... A she bit must of... know he bought the pillows, though. Maybe. Maybe. Then I just it... like, though, when she talks about, oh, I feel as though they probably did just let me break my leg when I went on my climb and mm-hmm. see what I did, or let me suffer, so I didn't think they were watching me. Yeah. And she was like, well, I'd do the same thing. <laughs> I, I guess so. I guess so. And then they're discussing the, you know, Shah's world and how the people there all came to be dead. Um, well, there's a big reveal. And, uh, there's a lot of description of the Dra'azon. Um, if you were a pure energy super species long retired from the life of the galaxy and your conceit was to cordon off and preserve the odd planet or two you thought might serve as a fitting monument to death and futility, Shah's world with its short and sordid history sounded like the sort of place you'd put pretty near the top of your list. Um, so they, they do describe there's this command system that the Shah's world people had built to survive a nuclear war, very similar to systems built um, you know, in our world for, for nuclear war. Um, and um, there's a suspicion that someone, possibly the Drows on, are keeping this thing um, intact over the millennium when just you know the movement of rocks in a planet would, would grind it away. Um, but... Um, 
Jace says, well, you know, they were pretty ingenious. And then Fowl's like, well, it's a pity they didn't devote a little more ingenuity to staying alive rather than conducting mass slaughter as efficiently as possible. Um, which, you know, we're desperately worried about our pandemic at the moment. And, um, you know, the, uh, the Shah's world people actually were wiped out by a disease rather than their nuclear weapons. But, you know, we've still got nuclear weapons in the hands of lunatics. Um, and when I say lunatics, I'm just saying all of our political systems are pretty irrational. Um, there's a little mention here of the, um, the culture's origin, um, which is very important for all of these books going forward. Um, where it says, even though the source civilization of its own mongrel past had been no less fallible. Um, so multiple civilizations have come together to form the culture is the, um, mm. the big point in that line. Um, well, there's the big reveal too, that the culture have a changer, a female changer. Yes. Which means that Horza is not representing all changes with his, um, uh, siding with the Adirans. Mm. Uh, yeah, I thought that was quite significant. Um, but also, the sense of the scale of the galaxy that this changer is two years away from being useful. Yeah, but didn't the Adirans in one of the earlier chapters sort of make a point that they didn't think the culture had a changer and that that would be quite dangerous if they had one? Uh, yeah, I guess so. But I mean, anyway, this one is, is, is on the, you know, at the other side of the galaxy and would take too long even for the culture to get them to, to where they're going to be important. Uh, we get our very first, um, culture ship name as well. It turns out that the mountain class, a general contact unit that, um, ambushed the hand of God, uh, was the GCU nervous energy. Um, and it turned out it had tried to capture the Adiran cruiser and, um, no one had heard from them since. And they think that the, um, they were both lost in it. Mm. This ship trying to be too cocky and capture a ship, it should have just blown up. There's a, now, there's a fun line here showing a bit of a scale, sense of the scale of what's going on, where Fal's saying, well, of course, we could force our way in there and blow the place to smithereens if necessary and to hell with the dryers on. And Jay's saying, yeah, we could do that. We'd put the whole outcome of the war in jeopardy by antagonising a power whose haziest unknown quantity is the exact extent of its immensity. We could also surrender to the Adirans, but I doubt we'll do that either. <laughs> And that's the getting us pretty much to the end of this, except Fal's sort of wondering, hmm, three to seven, depending on whose hand we're talking about. Yeah, and then she seems to go off and do a little bit of a think, a bit of a contemplate, which seems to be what these culture folk do, just navel gaze a lot. Yeah, well, you know, stare at the mountains, go yeah. climb the mountains, uh, have their audio books playing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's a post-scarcity society, Sheridan. No one wants for anything. No one can be coerced into anything. It, uh, they're all just having the t- whatever, doing whatever they want to do all the time. Yeah, wow. It's luxury gay space communism. <laughs> so, as the as the new reader to this, uh, firstly, who's who's your MVP for the um, for the chapter? Ooh. That's a tough one because you've got two chapters, essentially, the one chapter. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'm going... Oh, I don't know. Jace. Jace is the MVP. Yeah. All right. Favourite ship name? Oh, well, I quite like the, the abbreviation CAT. Oh, for Clearer Turbulence. Mm. Okay, so that's beating out nervous energy. Mm. Mm. Okay. All right, then. And what do you think is going to happen next? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's just summarize what you think of the culture having spent a subchapter in the culture. They're an annoying bunch of twats asking around with frivolity. They are the type of person that if you went to dinner with them would agonise over the wine list. Mm. And then, you know, Whereas the correct they response, sniff their wine. The, the correct response is to say, what are we eating and ordering red or white appropriately and the cheapest. Ask the waiter. Ask the wa- yeah, that's the correct <laughs> response. Just ask the waiter. See, now you think like a culture citizen, you just get the... The other might, the other intelligence to sort out for you. You don't rely on your own wits. 
Okay, well, thanks for being patient with us, folks. And we're sorry we've been a little bit late with this due to a lot of circumstances and Sheridan not doing the reading. Well, I didn't uh, know it was <laughs> two chapters and two bits. Uh, and um, we will try and be back uh, at a more regular time uh, at the end of this week, um, which is also my birthday. Hooray! Yay. Uh, and on that note, we will um, let you go. Thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate you all, and um, we will be back soon. Thanks, folks.